Welcome to Longevity Industries' presentation of the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. I am your host, Dean Phillips, and I am proud to be here today. Our sponsors of the show is the Precision Metal Forming Association and the PMA's Educational Foundation. We are happy to have them as a host. And today I have with me Dr. Christopher Saldana. And he is from, uh, he's an assistant professor over at Georgia Tech, and we're very glad to have him on here today. Welcome, Chris. Hi, Dean. Thanks for having me. Look forward to a nice chat today. Excellent. And uh, first, first off, tell us a little bit about your background. Sure. So uh, I've been at Georgia Tech since 2014. Uh, I've been on the faculty here in mechanical engineering, doing uh, research in a, a couple of different areas related to advanced manufacturing, looking at developing new processes for uh, realizing new products using a range of techniques, including added manufacturing, hybrid manufacturing, and uh, conventional manufacturing processes. Uh, before that, I was on the faculty at uh, Penn State University over in State College, Pennsylvania, uh, where I was a Harold and Inga Marcus uh, assistant professor over there. And before that, I was uh, I got my degrees at uh, Virginia Tech as well as at Purdue University uh, over there in Indiana. Uh, so I look forward to the chance to speak to your listeners today and uh, talk a little bit about my uh, interest in manufacturing. Excellent. Excellent. Now, we did have on before uh, Dr. Tom Kerfus, and uh, we were glad to have him on. And what I'd like to, uh, I've asked him quite a few questions regarding uh, what was going on at the school to try and uh, be prepared for the future of manufacturing. And tell me a little bit about the technical side of, of how we're going to execute some of our, our five-year plans. What, what things are we doing differently now to try and make that actually happen? You know, it's, it's great to have good ideas and have things like the uh, smart manufacturing, but when it really comes down to it practically, what are some of the things that we're doing to, to focus on that? Sure, that's, a, that's, a, that's an excellent question. Uh, in, in, in manufacturing, obviously, the, the technologies that are coming out today and that have been uh, under development for some time uh, and that will be part of the future of manufacturing are, are fairly different than uh, you know, the, the, the things that have been used for, for a long time before this. Uh, so looking at the, the rise of uh, the use of Internet-enabled manufacturing, the importance of Internet-based technologies for uh, enabling better processes, that's changing the way that we do things in terms of monitoring and control um, and the rise of new technologies like additive manufacturing and the integration of those into uh, conventional workflows for making things also is changing the way that we do things. Um, so to prepare for that, uh, really, you know, that what we're doing at the Institute at, at the, in the academic side is looking at how do we engage students in these new areas? How do we uh, reinforce the skill sets that are, are needed for uh, individuals that are coming out in these areas to really take full advantage of the, the new capabilities that are, are coming up. So in those areas, uh, you know, we, we look at both, you know, at our mission as an institution is to look at training the full ecosystem from uh, undergraduates who are focused on you know, getting their bachelor's degrees and entering the workforce after a four-year uh, college uh, experience. As well as at the, at the other end of the spectrum, training the next set of uh, advanced engineers, people that will be in the R&D organization uh, and developing the next set of technologies that will be uh, important to uh, manufacturers in the future. So looking at how do we design curricula as well as uh, projects and experiences that, that, that incorporate these kinds of things is what we're looking at. We have a number of projects that are going on at the Institute right now. Uh, that engage undergraduates in uh, learning about cyber manufacturing techniques and cyber manufacturing technologies. Uh, so how do you use uh, some of these Internet-enabled devices for uh, projects for monitoring uh, your manufacturing operations? How, how do you do that? What are the skills that are needed uh, from a programming perspective, from a hardware perspective? So those kinds of things are now being rolled into the curriculum uh, by several of our faculty, including uh, Tom and myself. Um, on, the, on the graduate curriculum side, we have uh, several projects going on as well. One, one that I'd, I'd mentioned here uh, uh, that is current and, and just recently started is a, is a major effort 
uh, between Tom and myself to start a, start a, a fiber manufacturing traineeship program here at, at the Institute. Uh, and this particular program is actually geared toward uh, engaging master's students and training them to be uh, leaders in their organization to uh, start these initiatives to get their operations um, making full use of the, the power of cloud computing, uh, internet enabled um, monitoring and control. Uh, and those are some of the challenging things that a, a lot of manufacturers are today. And when we talk to you know, people in small business, these are, these are hot topics from the standpoint of hiring. So you know, developing these skill sets in these areas is one thing that, that we're looking at. Uh, in addition to preparing people for uh, uh, careers in this, in this field of manufacturing, this changing landscape of manufacturing, we're also engaging in research projects in these areas, engaging directly with uh, large business, small business, the federal government to push forward uh, new initiatives in these areas. So what are some of the, the ways that we look at, for example, the use of additive manufacturing in conventional workflow for producing complex products? For example, we're working with uh, several aerospace companies to look at how you use added manufacturing to repair components, which is a, is a major use case for additive manufacturing. And there's really not as much uh, science there behind what is the role of added manufacturing in changing the way that a part performs if you're using it in a repair process. Uh, so, you know, from the entity perspective, we, we look at, uh, you know, both the training side of things as well as how do we push these uh, initiatives to develop uh, from an R&D perspective uh, an advancement in these areas uh, to, to, to realize the potential for um, use by uh, people such as the, the, the ones that are listening to this podcast. Right. It, it's, it's interesting when you talk about the use of the parts that you're making in additive and how long they might last as opposed to their counterpart uh, being made through uh, some other standard manufacturing process. Because I think that from talking to some of the people in maintenance areas, one of the interesting capabilities that may not be, may not prove out in five years, but the desire to be able to print a repair part that you need to get your machine running again. Do you think that that is something that is possible or maybe just to make it just to get you running again until you can get the correct part? Uh, what is your outlook on that usage? It, it, it's very interesting. It's a great question. Uh, and we speak to uh, many different uh, stakeholders in this area. Uh, people that are interested in repair technologies or remanufacturing technologies, uh, you know, you're typically looking at supporting legacy components, for example, things where, the, the investment to remake that component or buy that component new obviously is something that is uh, a significant cost. Um, the challenge challenge with that is is when you're typically those kinds of components are performance components and components that obviously the the engineering that went into designing the material properties for that component and the production sequence uh, uh, for that initial first part is something that uh, is, is not not something you can take that's, that's trivial for say. Right. Um, so the qualification that's necessary uh, for that is, is something that the inherent challenge of additive manufacturing. Uh, additive manufacturing, you know, your the high sensitivity to uh, the parameters that are used in that process in terms of uh, how you control uh, the laser that's used in that process, and the actual powder input that goes to it, and what is the output uh, in terms of the uh, resulting material properties for that component. Um, so there is a lot of interest. It's really going to depend on our ability to impart process control, which I think as a community, the manufacturing community, we've done that a lot. We've done a very good job at, at doing that for conventional processes, uh, for example, metal casting as well as in machining processes. And where the, the whole community is going towards right now and, and additive is trying to really harness process control for additive manufacturing. And that requires constant monitoring of the process and to treat each article that comes down on the part as uh, something that you want to control. So that's, it's going to happen. It, it, there's a lot of benefit to it. Just a matter of uh, putting the resources behind it. And uh, with enough time, I think we'll solve it as a community. Sure. 
do you see a lot of uh, improvements being made in the material science end of additive manufacturing in the next five years? Because I know that that certainly has been a concern with the durability of, of the parts being manufactured is can they hold up and can we do anything in the actual materials to make them hold up better? Sure. Uh, that's also a great question. There's a lot of uh, concern, obviously, with the, the properties of these, these components. Uh, and uh, there, there are active efforts right now, and we're involved in a few of them, to try and understand what are the uh, new challenges that these kinds of uh, components and the way that they're built, how do they affect the, the properties of uh, uh, the final component as you, as, you make, as you make it using a process like this. Uh, and yes, it, it's going to be a, a challenging way of doing things. Uh, we, we have new techniques that we have access to that are helping us. Uh, for example, uh, computed tomography is a, a method that's been used for a long time in the medical sector mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in, in other fields to try and uh, measure how components or uh, other structure changes internally. We're using those methods now to try and scan these components, these additives and manufactured components, to understand how their material properties are related to the, the, the structure that we can measure in within them so that we can tie that back to, to quality parameters. Uh, so there's a, there's a lot of effort in trying to model uh, the effect of these processes on the material properties that are resulting in the final components. And there's a big push, actually, in the material science community to develop a uh, the idea of these twins, uh, process twins, product twins, where you can track how the parts are being made so that if you are able to, for example, if you're using a, a pyrometer or, or some sort of infrared camera, understand what is the effect of a particular measurement signal on the final properties of a component. Um, so there's, there's, there's a great amount of uh, interest in that area, and, and I believe within the next uh, five to ten years, I'd say, you're going to start seeing that that problem has been addressed, and, and we can get through some of these inherent uh, uh, preconceptions that people have about additives when manufactured components, for example, that perhaps they could be used uh, if you do incorporate them into conventional workflows used for uh, uh, making performance components. Excellent. Where do you see the the direction going now for things like AR and you know, even you know you know the augmented reality or the uh, artificial intelligence systems, where do you see that fitting into into the future? Sure, yeah, that's, that's a that's a very interesting question. I think augmented reality as technology is, is really starting to. Uh, go up, I think, in terms of uh, the consumer sector. And uh, by, by that, you know, you're starting to see interest from the manufacturing sector because of the, um, the growing toolkit that you have available for developers in this space. You look at what Microsoft has put out in terms of uh, uh, open hardware for people to work with. Uh, augmented reality, in particular, I think has a huge, uh, might have a huge impact in how we do things on the shop floor, you know, supplementing what a, what a, uh, mm -hmm. a worker sees on the shop floor to give them a better uh, heads-up display to what's happening and what, what information to, to really digest in the shop floor is pretty important. Uh, so these things might help either people troubleshoot processes. They, they might help people in assembly operations to, uh, for, from a training perspective. What are the things that you need to pay, 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 pay attention to in terms of the, the process? And part of that will develop as we start seeing uh, the, the hardware developers that are providing things like Microsoft and, and the, the, also the VR community as well, um, putting out those kinds of things. So augmented reality, I think, we, would be pretty interesting in terms of its impact on, uh, on shop floor operations. Mm -hmm. uh, the other side, the artificial intelligence side, uh, it, it also can be very important. And, and I'd say that the AI or you know, the machine learning community is, is the Kind of the same community, really. This is going to be really important when we start looking at big data in manufacturing. And when you, when you talk about big data in manufacturing, you really need new techniques for uh, understanding what is it, what's important about that data. We, we, we work with a lot of companies right now that 
have massive uh, data pools or data lakes where you know you can't run your your typical kinds of queries or your typical kinds of uh, calculations on these massive data sets because essentially what you're going to do is crash your cloud resources or, or any of your computing resources that you have on site. You really need new techniques like machine learning and uh, the suite of machine learning tools that is available to you to try and digest this information and try and make sense of it. Um, there's a lot of open source tools that are out there now, uh, Google, Amazon. If you, if you go to these resources, you'll find that there's uh, a rich set of capabilities that are being provided because this, uh, a lot of work has been going on in the machine learning community for some time, albeit in a different sector, but you know, for manufacturing, we have the advantage of being able to use these tools in a commodity fashion, which would be very interesting, I think, for the next generation. Right. And, and, and I think that's something we, we can definitely take and learn from uh, other areas that are doing things. We don't have to go out and uh, learn by our own mistakes. We can <laughs> certainly gain from the knowledge that the, these other industries have uh, been able to harness and utilize uh, we can take the same advantages of and do it at a much more accelerated rate now that uh, we're, we're basically not reinventing the wheel, so to speak. Do, do you see... Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, do you see the students uh, embracing this now? Uh, I, I don't know what level most of the students come in from an artificial intelligence or uh, big data kind of side of it. D do you see more students coming in with that background? I, I think the students have the fundamental uh, knowledge in this area. They're, they're great at uh, computation, math, and uh, accessing these kinds of resources. I think the really unique thing about uh, students today is that they have access to these things at their fingertips. Uh, they, they can go online. They can learn about these things. A lot of them, they've already learned it before we've, we've talked about it just because we've mentioned it's an interest. They can learn about it themselves on YouTube or any of these uh, online uh, education resources. And then beyond that, they have access to the tools that are available freely to them through open source kits that are available through Google's uh, cloud resources as well as Amazon resources. And this is, I think, the, the thing that's really changing, I think, in, in education is that you give the students the problem, they're going to find the tools that are out there just by the virtue of it being openly available. So that's really an exciting part of, I think, what's, what's changing with the way um, we're going to be approaching problems in the future. Uh, students don't need necessarily the formal training. is They're going to find the resources, train themselves, and then use the, the tools that are out for them to solve the problem. Is, is that something that, uh, at a university level, you see more uh, desire and, and, in fact, even pushing students to uh, solve problems utilizing resources from outside of the university to go out and solve these problems uh, utilizing the tools that are out there, whether it be on YouTube or whether it's uh, some, uh, uh, I guess, information sharing site, uh, blogs even to that point of uh, developing their skills in ways that are, are going to be more practical, because that's probably the way they're going to solve some of the problems when they get out there. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I, I see it definitely happening in that direction. And, and actually, I, I think you'd be surprised. Oftentimes, I think it's, it, it, you might find that it's the, the force that perhaps provides too much structure for them to solve a problem in one way. So mm -hmm. what we've been looking at, Tom and myself at Georgia Tech, is how do we open up the curriculum and open up these experiences where we give them open-ended problems to solve so that they can bring whatever tools they can find to solve it. So, yes, I think the, 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 the way that they will approach things is not using the typical methods and analytical approaches that we have in textbooks, but using computing resources and other kinds of software, open techniques, uh, other communities, borrowing from them and applying it to their problem. That's really where there's going to be really good synergies, I think, in terms of learning for us as a community for solving these manufacturing problems. I think that the nice thing that the university provides is a space for them to do that in these environments uh, with the problems that, that the faculty help develop that, that are, are useful for them from the learning experience. 
And then also using uh, state-of-the-art technologies and platforms that they have available to them through the university, like our maker uh, kinds of activities as well as the manufacturing resources that we have available. Yeah, I I, I, I can certainly see that. And I, and I think it's, it's it, to the benefit of the the uh, institution too, to embrace those uh, the the new ways of of learning beyond just uh, saying hey you've got to learn it just this way and not try to look at you know creative problem solving. Do you, I have an interesting question for you? Uh, not too long ago when we that we started getting into this push for uh, STEM curriculums, um, I was a staunch person who was against when the steam, you know, so when, when the arts started to filter into it, I was, I, I, at the time I did not see a benefit to that, but I could tell you right now, I, I have certainly changed my position on that. Seeing the way that people that are more artistic have an interest in the 3d printing, et cetera. What, what about, what have you seen at the institution levels of I guess bringing in the arts in with the engineering side of uh, of the school. Yeah, that's a that's an excellent question, actually, and I think 3D printing really changed the game for everybody. You know, yeah. before if you wanted to to make uh, a complex structure or make anything that's uh, useful from a structural perspective, obviously you'd need to be fairly good in the shop in terms of either uh, obviously good on the router or good on a, uh, with a cable saw or with a, with a machine tool to make something. Now with 3D printing, uh, you have people, for example, the people at Oak Ridge uh, printing large structures uh, for for artists in, in open areas is a great great example, I think, of, mm. of uh, people using additive manufacturing that would not have been makers in any sense of the word, I think, before that. Right. Um, so... Uh, the role of, of art in, in uh, the connection to manufacturing is very interesting. Um, I think what you're seeing a lot also that is related to that is how software's changing. And we, you know, at, at the Institute, we use, we use software for a variety of reasons. Uh, we use uh, modeling software, CAD software to uh, you know, model components. And you look at uh, how a lot of those softwares that have been designed in the past have been designed more for engineers. You mm-hmm. look at the the Katias, the Proes, and those are all built on the same kind of approach to modeling, uh, 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 direct modeling for, uh, for for coming up with the components that you you want to produce from an engineering perspective. Uh, but when you look at the making community, a lot of the tools that they use for approaching things are maybe more from the the computer graphics community and the art art community. Um, so I think what you're you're going to start seeing, and, and we're seeing it here at the Institute with the techniques that we use, is a uh, uh, connection or a mixing of these kinds of methods where, where you're going to start seeing that the engineering tools are changing because a lot of students that come in now have maybe more familiarity with the art uh, artistic way of approaching, for example, how you come up with a, a shape or things like that that you want to model and then later to manufacture. Right. So, so art is, is essentially something that will be I think something that, that is going to affect the way we do things in terms of manufacturing. That's a great question. Yeah, I I think that in the past we had very rigid ideas of what could be manufactured. We had, well, you have to do it this way so you can only make things that fit in this box. And I think the art side of it has really challenged the first of all a lot of things we can't even simulate. It, it would take so much time to even simulate it. But if you can draw it, if you can come up with it in 3D, and you can go ahead and pull it into a printer, you try it and see. And uh, and it's been an amazing adventure from what I've seen. I had the pleasure of being at Tennessee Tech and uh, being involved with the judging and the competition for additive manufacturing, and I was astounded by the different approaches that people took uh, in, in being creative with, with the, there was everything from making something very simple like a gear to making something like uh, an artificial limb to making uh, medieval coins <laughs> to, 
to making just artwork in 3D. I, I just seen so many different options that, that were there. And it was really up to the creative juices of, of the individuals. Do, do you find that more engineers are, are kind of maybe enlisting a, a section of the way that they wouldn't have normally done that in the past? Yes, it's a, uh, I, I would say so. It, it's an interesting, uh, interesting question. Does that change the way that people model things now that you have freedom to do whatever it is that you want in terms of uh, modeling and later making? Um, yeah, I, I'd say that they're thinking less about that, which is, I think, the, the, uh, the attractiveness of, of additive manufacturing 3D printing. You don't really have to worry about can it be made or not. That's what a lot of people think. But, but I, I think the caveat to that is that you'll find that a lot of the students also realize that just because you modeled it doesn't mean it can be made. There, <laughs> there, there is some process engineering that goes into that. Yep. Uh, you can you can model it up, but how did you orient it in your, your build envelope? What, what is your build direction? Some of these questions, actually, uh, what we find is that uh, the students learn those things empirically, which is actually a, itself a learning experience. So, you know, at our institute, we have this wonderful organization called the Event Studio that people can submit whatever kinds of designs that they want to that organization. They'll print it for them, and then you'll get it for free. Huh. What, what a lot of students are learning in that process is I'll submit a job, a particular model. It, it didn't print so well, partially because... Yeah, your the angles that you use to print that are probably in violation of some fundamental limits for that process. Right, and then they learn that uh, naturally. So it's a you get this experiential kind of learning on additive manufacturing that happens a little bit more naturally, uh, which is uh, itself also learning experience. So yeah, while it it unlocks some of this uh, natural restrictions that you have from a design perspective, uh, what you'll find is that some of the students actually learn that there are some restrictions and they mm -hmm. they learn from experience that. How do you get around those? So it's, a, it's an interesting technology from that perspective. That's great. Well, Chris, thank you so very much for, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be here today. I really do appreciate it. And uh, we'd like to thank our sponsors, the Precision Metal Forming Association and the PMA's Educational Foundation. This has been the Destiny of Manufacturing podcast. Go out and make it a great day.